Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Welcome to the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight Howard folks that are blazing the trail and making moves. Today, we have a, a very special guest. It hasn't been this much excitement around Howard Athletics since I can remember, and I go back to, to 99. But uh, today's guest played at Duke under Coach K, played with the likes of Grant Hill, Christian Leitner, Bobby Hurley, this guy from Maryland, Gatorade Player of the Year, McDonald, All-American. This guy was a captain on that Duke team his senior year. Coached under Lefty Drysdale at LaSalle at Delaware. Coached with Tommy Amaker at Harvard. Uh, some would credit him for finding Jeremy Lin and Lin's sanity. But we're talking about Howard today. We got Maker McCour. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Because this guy's a five-star athlete coming to Howard. And then we got the other transfer from Duke. I mean, from uh, Purdue that's coming to Howard. But I want to talk to Coach, the head man, Coach Kenny Blegney. Welcome to the show. Thank you, man. How you doing, man? Everything well, Josh? Everything. Everything is great. Everything is great. You know, so much excitement around Howard, and you know, I, a lot of my friends went to Big Ten schools and, you know, ACC schools. So I've been the butt of many sports jokes ever since uh, graduating from Howard. So now, you know, we have this movement where a lot of athletes are not just taking visits to HBCUs, but are actually committing. And I always said, I always said, you know, at at the very least black schools should be at least at mid-major level like top 40 at the very least and we haven't seen that but you know I just want to start by you know asking you, you know, how do we go from 4 and 29 to now we got a five-star recruit at Howard what was the magic sauce what did you do well I, I think starting at 4 and 29 when I got hired last May um, I was the second to the last division one head coach to be hired um, which means that by that time, uh, a lot of the prime recruits were already taken. Um, we came into a program where over 50 points had either graduated or transferred out um, to start. So we returned probably, you know, the least amount of points in the MEAC for sure, um, and maybe even one of those teams in the country with, uh, with so many guys that had left or graduated. Um, so it was last year was going to be a, a year of, uh, of transition and growing pains. And I understood that and our administration understood it. And it was something that we just had to try to go through to get to the other side. Um, we brought in uh, a group of freshmen that uh, worked really hard. We were able to redshirt two um, and allow those guys to develop uh, their bodies and also mature a little bit. Um, we had one in Wayne Bristol, Jr., uh, a six-six wing from Upper Marlboro, Maryland, who was uh, the MEAC Rookie of the Year. Um, he was a young man that shot 40% from the three-point line, 50% from the two-point field goal uh, space, and 80% from the free throw line. So for a freshman to go 40, 50, 80, I think uh, was really, really a good look uh, in, in, in budding for the future of our program moving forward. Um, And then, you know, working with uh, our staff, you know, trying to put together a plan of how do we not only attract, uh, I think we just want to attract good players. It wasn't that we were trying to pursue five-star kids, um, but with some relationships and uh, a lot of hard work, we were able to kind of get in the door. And by getting in the door, we were able to kind of, I think, um, really show uh, what aligning with a, a brand like Howard and our program uh, would look like for them in terms of things that we, they can do uh, to get better as players, uh, things that they can do to help our program get better, uh, but things they can also do in terms of their marketing and branding and their exposure. Um, and it, you know, having a vision for that, trying to uh, put together all the groundwork to push those things forward, um, and then having it all come together was, you know, was great. It was something that. Uh, like I said, I, it, it, I, I thought we could make it happen, um, 
but when it actually came to fruition, it was, uh, you know, one of those moments that would just, um, I think, you know, allowed us to now take the program and speed it up a little bit for, uh, faster than what we initially thought. Um, that's amazing. That's amazing. So when you, when you come into a, a culture like Howard where, you know, we're not known for our athletics, but we do have, obviously we get some athletes here and there that go on to have some professional success whether it's coaching or, you know, playing at the next level. I mean, can you talk about, you know, the culture when you came and like, did you have to, you know, did you have to change the culture? Did you have to clean house or, or bring in your own people? Like what type of uh, dynamics did, 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 you know, what type of challenges did you have to face? Yeah. I mean, it, you, you come from Duke. I mean, you're, you're a national, <laughs> you're a national champion. So you know, it's not like you just doing, and this is your first head coaching job. So I'd imagine, you know, you have a ton of optimism, like, oh, I'm about to be the guy that comes in here. I'm going to change everything. If you're not with it, you know, there's a door, you know, what was your attitude coming in? Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, being humble coming in um, and, and not really having expectations. Um, it, like you've mentioned, it was my first head coaching job. Um, I had some ideas and I had some thoughts and, and had put together a whole, you know, 60 page business plan of how I thought things could go. Um, so there was some vision there, but quite honestly, you know, I grew up right down the street from Howard and spent many days growing up uh, on campus or right across the street at Banneker playing baseball as a, you know, a little leaguer and, uh, you know, playing basketball at Banneker and doing all the things that you do as a, a kid growing up in the DMV in this community. Um, and one of the things I kind of always, I think anybody from DC questions is that, is Howard serious about athletics? Um, because when we're growing up here, we always say like, you know, look, we've been here for, you know, for a long time and we've never seen Howard make any improvements to, you know, Bird Gymnasium or to, Green Stadium or, you know, so it, it was like, you know, but I understood, I understood this, Josh, I understood that Howard gave me a tremendous resource. And that's the brand Howard. Now, how do I take that brand and make it into something that becomes a, you know, a brand that can be now a basketball brand? because we know it to be an academic brand. We know it to be a brand that stands for black excellence. Um, now, how do we take that same brand that has done so much um, with all of the alums uh, throughout the years from, you know, David Dinkins to the Andrew Youngs to the Third Good Marshalls to the Chadwick Bozemans, how do we take that brand and now parlay that into basketball success? And that's been the, the thing that we've been uh, working so diligently on and really trying to move that needle uh, in doing that. So um, we've had to use alums like yourself in terms of uh, all the wonderful things that you guys have done, all your accomplishments, um, all of the, 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 the you know, trailblazing that Howard alums have had um, in our story to, I think, recruit uh, this group of young men that we're coming in that we think can change the you know, the face of our basketball. So, so what I hear is we might be the next Duke because when coach K came in, he had a horrible record, right? He had yeah. a horrible record. Duke stood by him. And now Duke is pretty much a professional, <laughs> a professional, uh, you know, sports team, you know, for lack of better words. But, you know, I, I, I totally agree with that you know, with, you know, with everything that you just said. So now when, when you were coming up playing basketball, did, and, and you were highly touted coming out of high school, did, um, did Howard try to recruit you? Uh, I, I don't remember Howard even sending me a letter, but just, uh, mm -hmm. I want to I go back to something you, you said about Coach K. Um, Coach K is a guy that is a huge Howard University fan. Huge. Like, mm -hmm. he sees it as a brand um, that can be, you know, something like a Duke. Um, and it's stuff that we have conversations about all the time. Um, and he wants to align his brand and the Duke brand with the Howard brand. Um, we just had a conversation about this maybe about a week or two ago. 
Um, so he understands the history and the tradition of our university um, and really appreciates it and what it stands for. Um, so we've been in you know, constant conversations about how do we grow um, the Howard situation to make it a, a situation that can be, um, to, that can reach its maximum potential. When we talk about Howard basketball, you know, I look at it like, why can't we be Gonzaga? Why mm-hmm. can't we be a Butler? You know, Butler was in the Horizon League before, it, you know, when it made the Final Four um, mm-hmm. and before it got to the Big East. Why can't we be a St. Mary's that's in the WCC? That's a top 25 program. Why can't we be a San Diego State? So, uh, you know, and, and then the one that I really use the blueprint for is Georgetown. Why can't we be Georgetown? You know, when mm-hmm. Coach John Thompson took over, it, it, Georgetown was just a, a, a great academic school that didn't have any athletic history or tradition. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, so I'm sorry to skid off on that a little bit um, on your question. But, yeah, you know, we, we have a chance to really, I think, use our brand to become a, a program that year in and year out is a great program. Sure. I mean, you know, you've uh, you, you talked about Duke earlier and then you, you've also coached at Harvard, which is obviously an academic school. And they've had much success um, uh, with their basketball program, especially since uh, – Tommy Amaker has has taken over. So I'm sure, you know, a lot of the challenges that you may face at Howard, where it's known as an academic school, which is a which is a great thing, you know, you can incorporate those same principles uh, you know, at at Howard. So I, I 100% agree with that. When it comes to like, you know how you watch a Duke game and I want to say like they call them the Cameron Crazies or something like that. How do how do how does like is when you come into Duke, is that something that who teaches who like how does that get established as I'm an incoming freshman, you know how does that get established? Because I know at Howard we have, you know we don't have that. I know we got you know we got a little madness, but how does a culture like that get established where you already in the other team's head psychologically before a tip off even starts? Yeah. That's, that's a great question. And, and Josh, one of the things that, you know, being at Duke and it's like something that we're trying to create here, it's passed down from generation to generation. So it's passed down from the seniors to the juniors, to the sophomores, to the freshmen. And, um, you know, it's like on the basketball court, you know, you learn from the older guys. Um, so the drills that we do or things that we do in practice, you know, I always talk about our older guys being in the front of the line so the younger guys can go to the back and kind of watch a little bit. And it's the same thing with, I think, that school spirit um, where, you know, certainly you have to win and connect the, the campus. And that's something that we're working on right now is how do we ignite the campus? How do we ignite it where we have alums and the campus community and everybody comes together to this thing explodes? Um, but yeah, it's passed down from the upperclassmen, which are seniors to the juniors, to the sophomores, to the freshmen. And that's something that we're trying to build right now, even with some of the, uh, thoughts and ideas. And, uh, I think some of the changes that we're talking about with the infrastructure of, uh, a potentially bird gymnasium, um, with trying to get the students on the floor, um, mm, try wow. to fill that bowl in, uh, that's around, uh, the court side. Um, can we get 1,500 more students on the floor um, where we have even more of a home court advantage? But it's also great for school spirit, and it's also great for the student body's experience that they can say that they took part of, um, you know, creating a, uh, a winning tradition um, and being part of something that was bigger than them, um, where they leave and have some incredible memories of their time at Howard. Wow. No, that's... I've always wanted to see something like that, you know, at Howard, because we do have a small gym that can really serve as an advantage uh, when, when we uh, host our home games. But I've always wondered, like, does that, does like the coach say, hey, all right, fans, this is how we're going to do? Like, how does that get started? And then how, does the, how do the fans know exactly what to do on free throws and the opening tip? Like, all of that. I would love to see, you know, that get incorporated. Yeah, those, um, those are all things we're working on. Great. I, I, I would love to see it, Coach. Um, another thing, so I know for a fact that if you have success, and you are going to have success 
you know, you're definitely going to be better than 4-29. And, and I know the expectation now is to win the MIAC. And, of course, the goal is to just make the tournament. And then whatever happens from there, you know, happens from there. I would hate for you to come to Howard, have success, and then somebody else come through with a blank check. Because <laughs> you know that's what's going to happen. And then take you away. How, how committed are you to – to being at Howard, you know, for the long haul, because I look at this as a turning point. Like you're, you're basically our coach K you're the guy that's going to come in, turn this thing around. Cause there's literally no expectations probably when you came last year. Now, now we got this hype. We got Kamala, we got Blakeney, like you right up there. It's Kamala <laughs> Blakeney, Thurgood Marshall. Like, you know, <laughs> you can't leave us coach. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'll just say this. It, you know, we're coming off a 4-29 and win season. And the thing that, like, even this morning, and it's every day that rings in my head, when McCorm Maker committed to us, he had the, uh, the honor and the privilege of appearing on first take with Stephen A. and Max Kellerman. Oh, uh, he was so uh, thoughtful in his comments, too. He was brilliant. He was brilliant. So mature, so poised. And one of the, the, the comments that was made was about, you know, they, they had talked about me and they said that they found out I was a good, good guy. And, but I was four and 29 and that resonates with me. And I was thinking this morning, like I, I, I see a scoreboard, you know, daily in my head of four and 29 and, you know, Howard's only had, I think two winning seasons since 1993. Um, coach, and, I was looking at it, coach. I mean, I was going back, Four and twenty nine, seventeen and seventeen, ten and twenty three, ten and twenty four, twelve and twenty, eight and twenty five, nine and twenty two. Going, I'm looking like I told you, I went to I went to every game as a freshman, yeah. and we did not win anything. Yeah, so I, I think we we need to we need to take some steps. Um, you know, I, I know Howard alums and and people that love Howard think we should be in the Final Four every year. Oh, um, absolutely. But but. <laughs> I want to, I want to, you know, look, if we win more than four games this year, it's making progress. Absolutely. Um, there's a, there's a long-term plan to this thing that, that is just, you know, I want to be at Howard mm -hmm. um, and I would love to be able to, you know, have sustainable success and a program that's creating young men that are, you know, not only killing it on the, on the, on the court, but also killing it in the classroom and killing it in the community and, that are, you know, family men that are, you know, doing incredible things. Like that is all really important to me. And it's things that I, that truly touch me and that I, I'd love, you know, for our guys and our program to, that's what I want our program to stand for. Um, I want our program to stand for service, leading and giving back. Um, so I, I don't have any thoughts, any ideas on being any other place but Howard. Um, you know, we're working really hard to, um, you know, get people to come contribute to our program so we can build and develop the infrastructure. Um, we're on pace right now to build a new practice gym that should be ready by the end of August. Uh, wow. one, um, have our locker rooms completed by the end of 21 of August of 21 and also our offices. And, nice. uh, you know, we're looking at things in Burr on how can we improve those things? Um, so I want to try to ride this thing out and see what it can become. Um, there's no, you know, when I took this job, I, I took it to become the Howard coach. And uh, my thoughts and everything that I'm doing is trying to build a program so we can be as good as we can become. Man. I mean, could, could you imagine back, imagine, you know, you coming back to the DMV and you taking Howard and you beating up on Georgetown, beating up on Maryland and beating up on Norfolk, beating up on all of the local schools after Howard has been the laughing stock for, for so long. You know, that would be an amazing story. So, you know, when when you were at a – so now in modern times, so I guess when you were coming out, it was common for players to say, I'm going to play four years at this school, no, no matter how good of a talent that you are. Now the pitch is, hey, you're going to go pro here. But you're kind of in that – in that – gray area where you you recruiting guys say hey we're gonna help you become a doctor after college <laughs> but then you're also going to get the guy like hey we're going to get you to the nba you know talk to me about your like your your recruiting your recruitment process when you're approaching when you when you're 
going to somebody like a McCore or somebody like myself who's probably going to be selling insurance, you know, after uh, after they graduate from Howard. You know, what is the what is the what are you selling top five players on versus, you know, guys that are just D1 talent? Yeah, great question. When when we um, when we were presenting our program and university to McCore Maker, we put over. I think it was like a 115 page marketing plan together on this would be um, a blueprint for you to um, go from things you want to do on the court, things you want to do off the court. And this is our plan to make this happen. Um, you know, I'll just give you some data. I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a numbers uh, and analytics person. Um, you know, since McCore Maker committed to Howard on July 3rd, 3rd um, he's gotten over 1 billion, billion with a B impression, social media impression. Um, <laughs> wow. That equates to about four, four and a half million dollars in uh, marketing exposure for him. So he's starting to create money and value for himself um, by doing something different and unique that, you know, has ever been done. Um, you know, he's had a chance to increase his draft stock um, from the time that he, you know, um, didn't commit to us to the time that he committed to us. Um, mm -hmm. Draft stock has increased. And that's just doing something that, like I said, that is outside the box, something that's unique. Um, but also, you know, I talk about branding a whole lot. You know, he, he positioned his brand with one of the best brands in higher education. Um, so... The, the, I think the, the presentations are, um, they're truly unique and they're different for every student athlete. Um, there's only going to be about 40 to 50 jobs that are changing over in the NBA every year. Um, and I understand that everybody can't be an NBA player, but, you know, there's guys that can be teachers. There's guys that can be police officers. There's guys that can be uh, computer science majors. There's, there's, there's so many different things that our student athletes can go on and have careers um, after they're done playing. And, and we want to try to, I think, um, you know, give our, our student athletes the best path and opportunity to do that. Um, you know, we talk about the shortest distance to change the world is between Howard University and Capitol Hill. And utilizing what we have in D.C. with Capitol Hill, we potentially may have a vice president in the White House. Um, we have entrepreneurs, we have lawyers, we have people that are in, uh, you know, all over every sector here. So why not connect them with mentors and internships so they can get practical uh, experience as well as resume experience? Um, we want our kids and young men to be the best of the best. Um, so when they're leaving Howard, they're prepared to, to be great men um, and Howard men. And I, I know what that truly means when I spend time with so many alums in different cities and meet Howard people all, all over the world. Um, Howard men are, are, are special people. And we would love for our young men to understand what that means and to be able to follow that blueprint and that path um, to go out and, and do some amazing things in the world. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what what did it feel like? Uh, and, you know, and anything I can do to help with that, because I've I have a lot of prominent alumni on the show. And um, of course, people are excited about uh, Senator Harris running for the VP spot. And everything else is going on, but there's never been this much excitement in 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 sports since I can remember at Howard. Um, you know, I put this stuff on social media and the comments and stuff go crazy. So I'm like, I'm trying to recruit as many whoever, you know, to, to come to Howard as uh, you know, as possible. So I I, I definitely think that um uh that's that's a wonderful thing and, and a great idea. Um so when when you're recruiting players uh, to come to Howard, how much does how much do things like academics, how much does that become a hurdle or things that you know uh, the gym not being a huge gym or not being on TV, how much of a hurdle are are those things? Because uh, I you know I would love to see more more of our uh, culture come to come to Howard. Yeah, just just I, I think you know it it's. I think initially it was something that was a little bit of an impediment. Um, and it was something that we had to build, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, we, we are in place right now to, you know, 
put those infrastructural things uh, and, and get them renovated and make them better. Uh, with our, our locker room, our, our, our gym, practice gym, and, and our offices. Um, you know, we had one recruit that came to, to visit that, uh, you know, I know he was joking around, but he, he saw a friend of mine on the West Coast, and with, my friend said, hey, man, how was your visit to, to Howard? He goes, it was great, but they didn't have crushed ice. So, you know, <laughs> right, okay. yeah, yeah, I don't know what that means, but it, you know, wow. so what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate every excuse that a young man can give us not to attend Howard. And right, because we know Howard can't pay players like other yeah. schools, so <laughs> no, we're not doing that. And, and <laughs> you know, I've never believed in that, quite honestly. Um, you know, so we're trying to position our program where players, where we make it really hard for a kid to say no to Howard. Um, and that's going to come with a lot of hard work. That's going to come with some fundraising. That's going to come with some sponsorship. That's going to come with some, uh, some growth in our program. You know, I, I think this year we'll have um, all of our games. You had mentioned this about TV. Um, I'm pretty sure all of our games, at least our home games, will be um, nationally televised, either by Fox or one of the ESPN platforms, ESPN1, ESPN2, or maybe ESPN3. Um, so we've taken the steps to, I think, increase uh, the sexiness of our program uh, over the last year where, you know, young men won't have to compromise anything by coming to Howard and being part of our, our, our campus uh, or our program. And that's how we're trying to create it. So we're, we're working diligently daily. Um, you know, it's not a lot of sleep. And we're trying to uncover every rock and stone that we can utilize in terms of our resources to, uh, you know, make our program the best program that it can possibly be. Wow, that's excellent. And just, you know, not to get off topic, but a good friend of mine, he's the uh, top basketball coach here in Chicago, Mike Irvin. So if you need me to connect you with Mike, they always get like the number one kids. I would, I would love to do that. But I, so what, what was it like? One, I'll give you one better, Mr. Josh. Oh, go ahead. I, I knew Mike's dad well. Was it Nick Irvin? Was that his dad? Mac Irvin. Mac Irvin, yeah. That's so right. you know from AAU and everything else, that family is is strong when it comes that family, to uh, that family is uh, is is on the the top of the the hierarchy pole uh, in in grassroots basketball. They've done a whole lot, man, helping uh, a lot of kids in the Chicago area, uh, mentoring a lot of basketball coaches that have gone on to uh, coach high school and college basketball. Um, they are like the first family of the grassroots basketball movement, man, and uh, much respect to them. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm glad to hear that you, uh, that you had that relationship in place. What, what was it like when – how did you find out that uh, McCor was going to commit? And not only that, I don't want uh, uh, no jail Eastern to get lost in this either. But what, what was – like where were you? Like did he tell you first? Did you find out like everybody else on social media? No, I, I knew about it a couple of weeks before it was even announced. Okay. Um, I found out on Father's Day. And I got a, I got a FaceTime call and it was like, I, I want you to remember this Father's Day for the rest of your life kind of call. Wow. Um, and it was like, you know, I'm coming to Howard. And I was just kind of like, what? Huh? <laughs> and, and I was like, is this real? Like, what, what are we doing here? Like, you know, is this something like, is this an April Fool's joke or, or is this done? It's completed. And, you know, it was like done. So for a couple of weeks, you know, I knew and couldn't say a word to anybody. Um, so I was going around like a kid in a candy shop, um, you know, probably with a bubbly spirit uh, that with this news in the back of my head that I couldn't share with anybody because, um, you know, I, I didn't want to spoil his, uh, his announcement. And, uh, you know, I, I we had a, a date planned on when he was going to announce was actually probably a couple of days or a week after um, he initially announced it. But I my phone started buzzing at like, you know, five o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, I'm like, why is my phone buzzing so much? I'm half asleep. I'm half hearing my phone buzz right beside me. And I'm thinking it's a family emergency. And I look from, you know, like I think it was about 5.43 in the morning, I get a text from one of the writers from CBS College Basketball, John, uh, John Rothstein, and he says, congratulations. And I'm like, congratulations? And, and I'm kind of like, on what? You know, and I'm, I'm getting all these congratulations texts, because I'm, I'm thinking that this announcement is going to happen, you know, in a week from now. 
not knowing. So I, you know, I start looking at social media and all of a sudden I'm like, I get mad. <laughs> because really? We had all these plans with ESPN and, you know, it was going to be a whole big rollout of, of stuff. Uh, but he just said he couldn't wait and he didn't want anybody else to announce it, um, that he wanted to just let it go. So, um, you know, it was, it was one of those moments that was just like, wow, you know, this is okay. Now let's, let's go to work. Um, and then it was kind of like, you know, all the other things you have to do with the due diligence to, uh, you know, figure out the application, NCAA, um, you know, clearing house because he was slated to go directly to the NBA. Um, all of those things, we just had to start to go to work and put those things in place. Wow. And he chose Howard over, what, UCLA? Howard over UCLA and Kansas, I think, were his, uh, his uh, or Kentucky. Um, might have been a class four, four schools, yeah. No, my, my cousin is uh, the assistant coach at, at Kansas, uh, Jaren's Howard. Yes. Not sure if you know him, but, uh, but yeah, that is that, – that, that's a hell of a story right there. So contrast that to your experience. I mean, you, you were – you from Maryland, obviously social media did not exist back then, but we had McDonald's All American, Gatorade. At that time, I mean, you you had probably, you know, a few entities that were recognizing the top high school prospects. And Gatorade and McDonald's are still at the top today. Um, what was the recruitment process for you coming out of high school? It, it was nothing like, you know, the way these young men get recruited today. Um <laughs> I, I was more focused on my academics and just trying to be a kid, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed, uh, you know, spending time with my family. I enjoyed spending time with my friends. I loved playing basketball. Um, so it, I, I, I was, you know, the, the business part of it, as these kids look at it today, um, is so different. They have so much more information than, than my generation had. And they're so much more savvy um in their brands and how to position themselves and how to market themselves than what we thought um we had such an an innocence and not to say that they don't have that same innocence but they just with the information they're so much more mature um these young men start playing aau um you know at the age of probably 10 11 12 years old um until they're 18 and uh they have their relationships with the aau uh, programs and they're traveling, playing 30 to, you know, 50 games a summer. Uh, you know, Josh, when I came out, man, we played in one AAU tournament, and that was your local tournament. And if you were able to win that, you went to nationals. So you may play, you know, a total of 10 AAU games all year. <laughs> and that was, that was wow. it. Um, so it, it's just so different now than, than what it was when, when I came out. And it, for me, it was like growing up playing on the playground. Um, you know, that was, that was where we kind of, uh, you know, cut our teeth out a little bit and, uh, you know, having some, having some, uh, a chance to play with older guys when you're young, having a chance to learn how to compete, because if you didn't win on a playground, uh, it may be an hour, hour and a half or two hours before you got on, uh, yeah. you know, so, or you had to go to another playground. And, and so, you know, the, the values and I think the lessons, life lessons that were, uh, you know, learned and taught to me growing up around older guys, growing up on the playgrounds were uh, certainly, I think, beneficial and different and unique than what today's generation has that uh, really, I think, gives them those, uh, that tries to teach them, uh, you know, life lessons through sports and athletics and basketball. A new ticketing platform that values event organizers so much more, eventnoir.com. Event Noir is the perfect ticketing technology for your events that rewards event organizers by helping them make extra money for each ticket sale they make. This platform truly allows event organizers to benefit from their own influence and hard work. Founded by veteran event organizers, Event Noir reinvests ticketing fees into its organizers that continuously use the platform and also enables its users with pricing power to adjust their rate for ticketing fees. 
But wait, there's more! Besides providing an easy process to set up events in a few steps and for attendees to browse for events and purchase tickets, Event Noir also features a variety of custom templates to create an event page, enhance ticketing and attendee management tools, and even includes the option to add live streaming events and more. Don't wait any longer. Get started today with Event Noir, the perfect ticketing partner for your events. Absolutely. Now, when you were coming out, did, did Howard try to recruit you at all? They, they didn't recruit me. They, we, one of my teammates who was a uh, McDonald's All-American, he was a Parade All-American, he is Gerard Mustaf, one, uh, one of my friends to this day. He was, uh, I was a, a sophomore when he was a senior. And um, Gerard's dad, uh, you know, was uh, very um, pro-black and a great man, Shar um, Mustaf um, was his name. And, you know, he really wanted Gerard and understood, you know, back then the value of having um, mentors that were black in terms of head coaches, uh, but also uh, wanting Gerard to have an opportunity to be recruited by Howard. And uh, so I saw that firsthand and uh, Gerard ended up uh, selecting the University of Maryland, but Howard was one of his top five schools. And he may have been the last maybe like five-star recruit that looked at an HBCU um, until, mm -hmm. you know, McCord chose to, to attend one. Um, but Howard did not uh, recruit me. I, I kind of, a lot of universities knew where I was headed. And uh, so they didn't waste their time in recruiting me that much um, because I, I grew up a Duke fan. We had a young, not a young man, uh, one of my mentors, Johnny Dawkins is from the DMV area. He grew up in my neighborhood before he moved out to, to the Silver Spring, Maryland area. Um, and he was just somebody I loved watching growing up. And, uh, you know, I, I just uh, loved how he played. I, I loved uh, the way Duke allowed him to play. So I, I wanted to go to Duke to try to, you know, be like Johnny Dawkins. Mm -hmm. So what, what was the, uh, the pitch that Coach K used to solidify you coming to do? I don't think it was a pitch, to be honest with you. Um, you know, Duke was one of those schools. And I, Josh, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood that is very urban. Um, and you, you see everything on a, you know, you go outside and you have, you know, street entrepreneurs, uh, you know, in the neighborhood, um, you know, you got every single element that you could think of that, you know, are in urban neighborhoods in my neighborhood. And it wasn't a bad neighborhood. Um, it was just what with the reality of the times at that, you know, that, that during that time. Um, so, you know, my, my mom, uh, coming from North Carolina and South Carolina, where she was born and raised and grew up, uh, you know, just stressed education. Um, she didn't have an opportunity to have some of the things that, you know, myself or siblings were, were able to, to have. Um, so education was just a big part. And I, I knew that Duke was one of those schools that, you know, was a great uh, school academically. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be one of the first people in my family to get a, you know, a degree. Um, and to get a degree from a place like Duke, I thought it meant a lot to our family's legacy, um, quite honestly. You know, We've had members of our family go to HBCUs. I'm the only one that probably did not go to an HBCU. Um, but, you know, for me, it was, uh, you know, to have an education of a place that I can say um, that really stood, um, you know, in my vision back then for uh, a place of, of great, um, I think, uh, academic excellence. Uh, you know, that's what I chose uh, to, to spend my collegiate uh, years doing. Hmm. So you, you get to Duke, um, on your left, you got, so, well, first you, you leave, you get a ready player of the year. So, um, McDonald's all American. Uh, and it's always funny how like things happen when you get to like this next level of basketball, you do have this success here and then you get to the next level, you have this success, and then you keep going, it gets harder, or sometimes, you know, you do better or worse, but you get to Duke, you look into your left, you got Grant Hill <laughs> right there, you got Christian Leitner, who's like the best college player of all time, <laughs> you know what I mean, 
You got, was it Bobby Hurley? Was he there too? You got Bobby Hurley who's there. You know, um, you're getting, you know, playing time, you know. Uh, are you, and, I, and I'm sure, like, when you come out of high school, you like, the NBA is, it's a realistic goal for you, you know. When you get to Duke, is it, um, like, what, do, do your goals change? Like, what's the mentality once you step on campus and you're like, man, I'm around, like, some really, really, you know, world-class athletes. Yeah, I, I think, you know, having a chance to play with three of the top collegiate players um, in the history of the game, three of the top 50 collegiate players in the history of the game, and being a part of two national championships, three Final Fours is... Uh, wow, that's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, I, I, you know, winning, winning for me supersedes everything. Um, and that's my personal goals. That's uh, individual goals. That's that's anything. I went to Duke to to become a champion, um, and nothing else. Um, Duke had gone to the Final Four, I think, maybe six out of the eight years before I got there. And wow. uh, you know, I knew they were very close to getting over the hump. Um, and you know, to have a chance to you know play collegiately with Grant Hill, who's a childhood friend, to have a chance to play collegiately with Brian Davis, who um, you know, was a, an, an incredible player at Duke, uh, played in the NBA with the Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, a childhood friend. Um, you know, it, it was just for me, like, I, I wanted to be a winner. I wanted to be a champion. Um, so those things were more important than my individual um, accolades, my individual stats, anything like that. And to play for a coach like Coach K, um, you know, a, a guy who is considered to be the, the GOAT of you know, you know, college basketball, certainly, but one of the goats of all basketball, um, you know, is, is what a unique opportunity. Um, you know, there's things that we did and accomplished at Duke that, you know, not too many teams in the history of the game can say that they were able to do. Um, I don't know if there's been another collegiate team in the last 40 or 50 years, probably not since the UCLA years that can say they've gone to three final fours and won two. Uh, I think Florida was, University of Florida with Billy Donovan was a team that won back-to-back. -back. So there's probably two teams in the last 40 years or maybe 50 years that have gone back-to-back. -back. Um, when, when you were there, were you, did you have that type of perspective? Or were you, you know, like, what, what, like when you're in it, I would imagine it's different than when you, as a full-fledged adult with all the basketball knowledge that you have, the perspectives are two totally different things. Like when I was at Howard, I wasn't thinking about Thurgood Marshall and Puff Daddy and Felicia. I was just like, man, you know, we got some beautiful women here. But then when I graduate, I'm like, man, all this history, I didn't even, you know, I didn't realize it. Were you caught up into the, you know, like how much of, uh, of that moment did you or did you not take for granted? I, I didn't take any of it for granted. Um, and, and it's the reason I went there. If, if mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I could have transferred at any moment in time and probably gone to a lot of other universities and had some personal success. Um, but I, I, you know, for me, winning, like I said, superseded everything. Um, being a part of history superseded everything. You know, I, Brian Davis, who's one of my, um, one of my teammates at Duke and uh, a guy from the DMV, um, just a wise guy beyond his years, you know, told me on his visit of two things. He goes, you know, it would be amazing to be a part of the first national championship in the history of Duke University. And he goes, if that happens, you can pick the phone up and you can call any Duke alum at any point in time and they'll take your phone call. And you know what? He's 100% true. Wow. You know, so it's, it's you know, and, and those are some of the things that we're talking about with, you know, moving our program forward. How do you brand? How do you market? How do you position? How do you separate yourself? And you do that by being on teams and doing things that are bigger than, you know, any individual um, accolade that you can have. Um, the team things certainly outweigh all of the, you know, individual accomplishments that you can, you can be a part of. You know, you look at, at March Madness, like for us, you know, we were, we were talking as a staff the other day, like, you know, if McCore Maker wants to be the number one pick in the NBA draft, 
okay, we need to win. We need to get to the NCAA tournament. And, what you know, it would be incredible if, just to make a run in the NCAA tournament. Um, but the winning is the thing that's going to be recognized more so than the individual accolades. Uh, LeBron James is considered, you know, one of the best, if not the best, um, because he's won so much. Michael Jordan is considered the best um, because he's won so much. Like, winning supersedes everything. And I want to... I want to bring championships to Howard University. Ultimately, that's the that's the end goal. Um, mm. To be a part of a, mm. a young man's life that gives him uh, a great four years of experience and mentorship and uh, you know life lessons, but also to to try to win championships. Wow! No, absolutely. I mean, hey, if they if if, if y'all win a championship, they can definitely call my phone. <laughs> <Anytime>. <laughs> I can tell you that. So, but even when you're at Duke, you <clears throat> you go from you know you're playing about six minutes a, a game as a freshman to as a senior. Now you're you're the captain of the team, right? Yes. So, I mean, what type of transformation does that go into? I I, I would imagine a ton of humility because if I was Gatorade Player of the Year, I'm gonna have my chest out going to anybody's campus. I don't care how good the program was, but you know you go from being a humble freshman, but he, you did win a title uh, or a part of two titles there. And then you go to now you're captain. What did Coach K see in you that w- would, uh, would would say, you know, um, Blakeney, you're my guy. You're going to be an extension of me when I'm not around. You're going to help me keep the guys in check. Um, I'm entrusting you with this franchise, this, this huge brand that is Duke basketball. And he's giving you those – reigns when you're like you know 21 years old and you got you know the likes of other blue chip players on the team like Trajan Langdon and and Cherokee Parks like what what is that like you know to have that type of trust from a coach and even at that point you're still not the quote-unquote best player on the team but you're like the best leader on the team yeah it's a it's a humbling it's a humbling uh thing when when you know a guy that's a, so accomplished uh sees something in you that is uh you know something of a leadership position um you know it, it, it's it's something that you know i i cherish that and value that so much uh and appreciate it you know it's uh, you know I, I like i said i i want to do the win i want to do the win to be a part of a culture and something that was bigger than me and uh, that, that's always how I always viewed it. And even with our program at Howard, it, it's something that I, you know, I want to instill in our players. Um, you know, the, the other stuff will take care of itself. And, uh, you know, Coach K is, like I, I've mentioned, he's a, a mentor. He's somebody that loves Howard. He's somebody that I speak to frequently uh, about Howard and uh, growing and building this program. So, um, you know, it, it's it's a family type of atmosphere that you once you're part of that family, you're 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 a member of that family for life. And uh, you know, just to to be able to, I think, have that accomplishment on my resume to have a guy like Coach K um, see those qualities in me, which he would select me as uh, as a captain of one of his teams, is uh, you know an honor that I would cherish for the rest of my life. That's wonderful. So, you know, as we um, you know what. As we get closer to the season, I'm sure there's going to be a ton of excitement, you know, and a ton of expectation. Uh, what what type of basketball can we expect to see from uh, from the Howard men's team, the, the men Bison? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a system that is uh, fun to watch and fun to play. Um, you know, we're we've uh, we've changed a whole lot from what we uh, did last year, and you know, I want to play a pace that's really fast this year. Um, you know, if we can average in the high 80s, closer to 90 points a game, that's something that I would really want to do. Um, we will be a three-point shooting team. Um, this team is going to be built around shooters, and this team is going to be built around analytics. Um, a lot of people aren't, uh, you know, probably going to be like, oh, well, this guy, you know. But um, we have got – that Duke in you right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Charles Barkley wouldn't like that. No, he wouldn't. But it's a, uh, it's a team that can really, really shoot the ball. And we'll shoot threes in transition. Uh, we'll shoot threes on the break. 
um, you know, we're going to try to put pressure on teams the whole game, offensively and defensively. Uh, the floor be opened up. I studied uh, over the COVID period with uh, a lot of NBA teams and NBA coaches. Um, so we'll incorporate a lot of NBA concepts into how we play this year. So I'm excited um, to see. We have positionless players. Um, we can play a team at, at any point in time that has four, ten, four players on the floor that are 6'10 or taller. And wow, that's nice. Yeah, so, I would love to see that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's, uh, we're, we're looking at this thing a little differently and we're trying to build it for the future um, so we can, you know, be one of those teams, like I've mentioned earlier, um, that's a Gonzaga, that's a Butler, that's a St. Mary's, that's a San Diego State, um, that can be a mid-major team that's competing year in and year out nationally. Yeah, and Gonzaga, like you said, I mean, they're perennially, they're always in the mix for like a sweet 16, you know, no matter what. Um, what can alumni, what can we do as alumni to, to help, you know, not just uh, the men's team, but Howard Athletics overall? My, my big thing is just show up, come back, show up, support. That's it. We, we can start there. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, want our, I want our program to be able to, I think, put together the pieces of, you know, campus, the DMV, and alums. Um, and then once that ignites, you know, I, I think we have something special um, with, you know, with our, our, our uh, Howard University community. Um, but the big thing things with alums is just come back, support, um, let our students, uh, student athletes see you. Um, see your success, see your face, um, see your spirit, see your love for Howard. Um, that's all I ever ask is just come back, support, and be a part of our, what we're trying to do um, and support the young men and women of Howard Athletics as they're doing their best to represent Howard in a, in a way um, that they would be proud and happy of. Man. Well, I, I plan to be there. One game that I – <clears throat> that I really wanted to come to was that I can't believe Notre Dame is actually coming and going to be playing at the Burr. I always wondered why don't these big schools come and play at on our turf because we will be going to schools like Duke and Kentucky and Maryland and just getting blown out. I'm like, man, why don't – if they're so good, why don't they just come to our campus? They probably still beat us, you know, but why don't they come to – um to Howard, how did you get Notre Dame to commit to, to playing at, at the Burr? Well, Mike Bray is one of my uh, mentors and, and really good friends. Uh, I, I've known Coach Bray since I was probably 13 or 14 years old. And my, my conversation with him, as well as other Power Five coaches, is that, you know, NCAA men's basketball teams are comprised of, you know, 65 to 70% African American males. And we are one of the most uh, prominent HBCUs in, in the country. Uh, our university has so much history and culture, as all the Howard alums uh, understand and, 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 and have been part of that you know, history and tradition. And I, I, I talk to the Power Five coaches as using it as an educational opportunity for their student athletes. Um, you have, you know, you have some student athletes that have never been on uh, an HBCU campus. And, mm -hmm. you know, so to bring a power five university, to bring a white university, a PWI university to an HBCU like Howard, you know, use it as a teaching tool. You can take your team to the African American museum. You can go to the Martin Luther King uh, monument. Um, there's so many cultural and educational things to do um, surrounding a trip to Washington, D.C. to play Howard University, and, but also to give your young men an opportunity to step foot on an HBCU, um, to see the history and the tradition and the culture of uh, our games. Our games are different than PWI games. We have, you know, four different uh, cheerleading and dance squads. We have a band that plays, you know, <laughs> music that, you know, it's it, in, in you. Yeah. So it's, it's different. And I think and go go music and doing the, butt. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. And we got, we got, we have, you know, we got, we have our, our menu and our concession stand is different and unique. Um, you know, so bring, bring your PWIs to HBCUs, expose your student athletes to um, 
educational, I think, experiences that are different than going to, you know, if you're Notre Dame, going to play uh, Georgetown or going to play Duke. Um, you know, come to Howard, experience our history, experience our tradition, experience our culture, and share that with your, with your teens because it's an incredible learning and educational and life experience uh, that they'll never forget. Man, I, I hope you guys stay friends after, uh, after we give them this W, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, after that game. Um, now, we touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, the move, this movement that players should be compensated for, you know, amateur basketball or pay for their likeness? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I love it. I absolutely love it. I've, I've been for it since I was a student athlete. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think the tough part is just how does it, how does it work? Um, does it work for non-revenue sports? Does it work for revenue sports? Does it work for, you know, smaller schools, mid-major schools, low-major schools? Does it only work for high-major schools? I think that's the, you know, the things that have to be worked out um, before it becomes, uh, goes uh, and, and becomes live. Um, but I love the idea that student athletes are compensated for their image and likeness. Um, I've always been a proponent of that. Um, you know, our, our college sports is a business. Um, and if the talent, um, you know, should, should also have a part or a partnership in that business. Um, so I, I'm cool with it. I, I love the fact that the NCAA and, um, you know, Congress uh, are, are taking a look at, at making this um, a reality and, uh, you know, can't wait for it to happen. Um, the image and likeness thing is really neat, um, you know, and, and now it's like, how do, you, how do you build brands within your program that student athletes can take advantage of that, that image and likeness uh, part of, of uh, what's going to take place in 21? Um, and those are all things that we're looking at. Those are all things that we're talking about. Those are all things that we present to our student athletes. We're, hmm. we're trying to be a four and headed the curve and, uh, and looking at this thing a little differently, probably than a lot of schools and certainly schools that are our size. Wow. So do, do you think that um, these, how are like these power five and blue blood schools having to pivot now that social media and COVID has kind of made the world smaller and, it's put a spotlight on programs like, or HBCUs, period. I mean, we see Deion Sanders going to, I think, Jackson State. And, of course, you, yourself getting uh, McCord to commit to uh, Howard. Um, and, I, I've obviously, you know, um, with coaches paying players under the table and doing and, and whatnot, you know, it's more of a microscope on a ton of things um, in amateur sports. Um, do these schools, do you see like the power five schools getting nervous? Like when you get McCord, are they, Hey, congratulations, Kenny. We so proud of you. Or are they like, Oh man, now all the black players are going to go to HBCUs. You know, <laughs> what are we going to do? You know, what are you seeing? Well, I, I think this, to be honest, Josh, there, there's in the power five schools. So there's 65 power five schools, right? And there's only eight black head coaches in that 65, um, 65 school lists. Um, so I, I hope what, what this period of, of COVID does is it brings an awareness that um, there's some racial inequities that are going on, um, you know, in our business that needs to be addressed. Um, there should be more black head coaches that are at six power, six, at power five schools. Um, you know, there should be more black head coaches, period, in Division One basketball. Um, when you're talking about comprising, you know, the student athlete, athlete percentage is anywhere between 65 to 70 percent of the student athletes being uh, black. And you're talking about, you know, only having maybe 90 to 100 black head coaches uh, out of the 350 some odd schools. Um, you know, those percentages just don't add up. Um, so I, I just want to be able to, um, you know, bring awareness to that. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't really, you know, everybody has to do their job. Um, I think everybody's been really, um, you know, kind of nice and, 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 uh, and gracious in us, uh, landing McCor. Um, 
all the people I've, I've gotten text messages from so many coaches and so many different people have reached out either through social media and uh, text message or, or through, you know, some type of uh, platform of communication. Um, I don't think the power fives are worried about HBCUs, um, you know, <laughs> too much. Um, there, there's still some, uh, there's still some things that HBCUs have to, continue to, to, to work at. And, and, you know, some, a lot of these kids and, and we're putting our house in, in order to be able to, I think, like I said, uh, provide for young men in a way that they don't compromise anything by coming to Howard in terms of the infrastructural things. Um, you know, for a lot of HBCUs, they're not going to be in position to be able to do that. Uh, and at the end of the day, these young men, they want to have a lot of the same, I think, uh, you know, amenities that NBA players have. Um, you know, they want to have a practice court. They want to have a cold tub. They want to have a hot tub. They want to have, you know, a nice locker room. Um, they want to be able to have spaces that, um, that they can, you know, feel comfortable in and feel good about, and rightfully so. Um, so we're just trying to get our house in order to put a position, all those things that, like I said, we can, uh, we can go out and recruit young men and show them, uh, how great and wonderful our university is. Mm. Do, do you feel more pressure now that you've landed um, not only McCour, but you have a returning freshman that was, you said, MEAC freshman of the year, and then you have the guy that's transferring uh, from uh, Eastern who's transferring from Purdue. Do you feel a little bit of a a target? Because before you were the hunter, now you're kind of being like the the hunted. I know Norfolk has – some good recruits that, that are coming there as well. But um, do you feel any pressure? Uh, honestly, I'm a black male that grew up in the hood, man. <laughs> so pressure to me was trying to get home every day <laughs> and stay alive. Um, right. You know, and, and, and playing and, you know, playing at Duke, playing at, you know, on, on that stage and being a part of, you know, a number of championships and stuff like that. I, it's prepared me for this opportunity. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I, I understand what we're going to be a team that's heavily watched, um, you know, with hearing that ESPN wants to come in and do all of our games. Uh, wow, that's crazy. Wait, so ESPN wants to do all the games? They want to, in, in, in one form or another, and they're ESPN 1, ESPN 2, ESPN oh 3, they want, you know, so, um, and that's all of our home games. We'll have probably a couple road games on, uh, you know, with the conference deal on ESPN as well. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, there's no pressure. The pressure is just, you know, waking up. Oh, don't day. leave us, man. Don't leave us. No, don't leave, man. So <laughs> don't leave. I, look, I, 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 you know, that, so it's just going to be fun. Um, I, I just need to have our, our guys ready, have them prepared and, uh, allow them to go out and play fun basketball with the whole world watching. Um, but that's what they should want. That's what they should have had signed up for because that's mm -hmm. what, the vision and the plan was, we just didn't know it was going to happen this fast. Wow. So fast forward, you know, if, if we were to, if I was to ask you, you know, what's the legacy of, of Kenny Blakeney going to be when it's all said and done? Um, how would you like folks to remember you? I don't, I don't really like, uh, it's not about me. Um, and, and not to say that I don't care. Uh, you know, I just, two things. One is that the program is in a better place when I left than when I got it. Um, and, and what I mean by, by left, it can be when I retired, um, or get fired, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, that, that is just that it's in a better place. It, it, did we, did we, did we make an imprint here that improved, uh, the student athlete and the student's experience at Howard? Um, that that's really important. And then, you know, I, I, that I love my family. I love my wife. I love my daughter. Um, and, and that's important for me. And like I said, I want to, I want these young men to see me as being a, a family man, as being a husband, um, and being somebody that showed up every day. And, uh, that's, that's, uh, that, that's what I really pride myself on. Hmm. I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome. Uh, uh, Coach Blakeney, thank you again for coming on the show. Um, I'm so excited to have you. I know um, you're probably getting requests up the wazoo. I can hear. How, how old is your daughter? She's 
she's three and a half. Okay, my my daughter is uh, four, my son is six, so I could, I'm, I'm sure that was her in the background. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. I'm super excited to see what uh, the men's team can achieve this year. Um, and I'm also excited that, you know, we have a leader like yourself um, at the helm, you know, preparing, preparing, preparing men, you know, to be leaders out here in the world. So thank you again. No, thank you, Joshua. I'd love to come on and give you an update throughout the season, man, and uh, keep all the Howard alums abreast and uh, hearing the first word from me on uh, how everything's moving forward. Absolutely. Thank you again. Take care, brother.